the argument from Hamas's perspective is incredibly clear. You know, their argument is simple. Either we die here in a cage or we die fighting for our freedom. You know, your death is inevitable either way, and it will come soon, you know, just judging from the average life expectancy in the Gaza Strip. Like, they have a very clean rhetorical right. front to that. So, you know, an unsurprising outcome, though I guess Netanyahu was caught off guard because obviously he's lost face with how quickly mm -hmm. Hamas moved through and broke through the... um defenses and and now yeah. of course like it's it's all done and it's over and we only have this to look at in retrospect because it seems like the only like uncertain fate is that of the palestinians that live in israel proper and in the west bank because the gaza strip is um it's uh it's uninhabitable yeah yeah and it, it's it, it puts the world in a you know really uh brutal position i mean obviously the people in gaza are in the most brutal position but the choice that is being deliberately presented to the world by Israel is do you want these people to die by disease and starvation or do you want to open up and just and and push them out those are like the only two choices that are being left Matt Miller the state department spokesperson said you know we're pressing Israel to like you know wind this down and you know allow the displaced Palestinians to go back to their homes and you're like, well, what homes? Yeah, the, like, to, we've, to the, we've all seen that. We've all seen the satellite imagery. Yeah, to the rubble that used to be, right? To the to vague the, uh, coordinates. Yeah, I, I don't know. I've I've always thought again. I like that term, the not just a crime but a mistake, because we're we're seeing that right now with Biden's popularity. He was already having issues, and now you know <laughs> the energized young voters who are a help in 2020 and 2022 probably not going to be as enthused with. Um, you know, following this this whole genocide business. And it, like, it seems to me like the Biden administration has looked at this and thought, at some point, this has to temper off. Like, at some point, like, the voters mm -hmm. will forget or, like, this will dial down the way it has in the past. And the more and more time goes on, the more it seems like it won't. And they're just kind of, like, waiting in they're like a, they're like a frog in a pot, right? Like, it, right. The, the, the chance to jump out and be unscathed mm -hmm. was a while ago. Right. And what they don't seem to recognize is that they're not dealing with the pre previous kind of Israeli governments um, or previous Israeli publics. You know, the, we talk about how or Biden has said, like, uh, October 7th was 15, 9, 11. And you know, it does actually feel like the Israeli public experienced 15, 9, 11 by virtue of the way that they're re they're reacting here. Um, I don't know how old you are. were on 9, 11. I was like 20. 21 or something like that i was in elementary was, school art class yeah so so i was like right so i was an adult so i was able to like i don't know i don't know if you could at the time but i could consciously comprehend and, and feel the jingoism and the like fury and the anger and the bloodlust that was pulsing through the american public which gave the bush administration for a pretty long stretch of time like a 90 percent plus approval rating bush could have done anything he wanted uh in the aftermath of of that and would have been loudly supported by um the american public and they would have uh denounced anybody who stood in the way uh, phil donahue the talk show host said like something you know softly about perhaps not um you know invading every country that didn't even have anything to do with this and like lost his show like it was it was like that kind of an environment and that that's what you're seeing now both with this already extremely right-wing government which is now fortified by this uh you know furious israeli public and so the biden biden seems like well i've dealt with this before yeah like you said it'll it'll cool off you know cooler heads will prevail and this will people will forget about this whereas it feels like you said israel's just sees their shot here they're, they they seem like Smotrich and the Ben Gavirs of the world seem like the only ones that have an actual plan for what they're going to do here. Uh, whether they can accomplish it is uh, is is an open question, but they do seem to have a goal. There's all this talk about the day after. You know, they they seem to have no intention of there being a day after, or or there not being really any Palestinians left in Gaza the day after. And then you're right. Then the question is, you know, what happens to the West Bank and um and the Arab Israelis, uh, but still, even in that situation, they're not going to be able to 
remove everybody, you still have a nearly kind of one-to-one -one population. And you just can't occupy a country one-to-one. -one. Like, can you imagine, like, Maryland trying to occupy Virginia indefinitely? Oh, well, they could try. Like, I... you, also, but you also have to run an economy. You have to, like... Go, yeah, it's kids it, need to go to school. Like, it seems. Yeah, I don't know. It, it it seems like it's like this is the consequence of doing half of the traditional settler colonialism bit. You know, like you can you can do a South Africa with like the full on apartheid, the separate military, whatever. Um, and Israel's still been able to extend that to the uh, Gaza Strip and the West Bank to an extent. But you also have a lot of Palestinians just mingling about, ostensibly free citizens in Israel, mm -hmm. which complicates things, of course, because their sympathies obviously are going to lie, you know, more heavily with their um, displaced or killed comrades. And it's like, it, it seems unsustainable all around. I mean, where the Palestinians mm -hmm. will go, what's to be done with the West Bank? Are you going to just remove half your population? That's probably why Israel keeps trying to court foreigners or like Americans to come down because they want to try to um, numerically counterbalance against the mm -hmm. local Arab population. It's it's settler colonialism, but dumber and more public. I don't know. It's it's right. Right. Playing out in real time. Like, yeah. It, it, you can it, watch it feels it. like it sort of feels like as you're following this day to day that you're reading this really impressive like investigative history book about how this was done you're like oh oh wow that's that's how it happened you know 50 years ago uh yet we're actually just seeing it in real time with the the main actors just posting on twitter about what they're doing like chris rufo style the whole way yeah it, it, exactly like i i guess um I don't know, at least before modern communication, I guess there'd be kind of like a, not a veil of secrecy, but at least you're not directly in touch with the people right. committing it and bragging about it. But Christopher Rufo is on, what is it, Substack saying, here was my nefarious plot yeah. to get people yes. to care about, you know, get, getting gay out of, of Harvard. Um, I'm so smart, I'm so wise. And meanwhile, like over from Israel, like their soldiers, the IDF are doing TikToks of them going like, ha ha, mm -hmm. you're gone, goodbye. And it's like, and You'd think in the face of all of this, I, I don't know, there'd be something more of a plan from the United States, which I don't think of as, I guess, a very credible or um, well uh, 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 forward thinking institution when it comes to foreign policy. But I guess I think of it better than this. I don't know. This seems lower than what I expected. The naive hope that this will just kind of like fade away. Um, right. Or, and or that we can escalate our way out of it. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, yeah. maybe if we just maintain a calm tone while abetting worse and worse atrocities. But I mean, there isn't even a place for the um the the Gaza Strip Palestinians to go. Like Egypt is still obstinate on that. I, right. I, I, yeah. Oh, no, go, no, go uh, ahead. Joe, Joe Biden has this anecdote that he's been telling for 50 years, um, where he was meeting uh Golda Meir, a former prime minister, and she said to him, you know, Senator, the thing that makes us different is that we have nowhere else to go. And and he has told that story so many times and it, it has resonated with him and he calls himself a Zionist. Um, it is it is it is one of his like formative Zionist experiences. But you you hear that and you're like, what do you who are you talking about? Who does have somewhere to go? Like, do Mexicans like if we like where do Mexicans have to go? Like the Mexico has some vacation home that they can just go to like who where do gazans have to go if you're if you live in gaza how is gold my air the only person who has nowhere else to go that statement uh, that biden made where where he was at that um uh, was it a, a dinner i forget the exact co context but where he said like um there's not a jew in the world that would be safe if it wasn't for the state of israel or like or like the it, it, like the state of israel is necessary for for all jews yeah. safety no, no he said he said it the way you first said it yeah insane uh, yeah. statement to make yeah. as the head of state of the united states which is which has like six or seven million jewish americans yeah like the same as israel basically like yeah, there's much, such a they're, they're much safer here frankly at, well yeah and right. they admit that too because they're always talking yeah. about the arab states and the the hamas rockets and stuff so by their own definition like they should be like oh okay well america's safer 
but that's like our project. So it, it's almost like Biden and the administration is deferring to this kind of like um, crude ethno-nationalism as a way of legitimizing the Zionist project, but in a way that only applies to them. Because true, it's not right. like if Mexicans needed a place to go, America would cleanly take them. We don't. It's a whole right. problem here. And it's not like they can just go south. No one can. No nation just takes other people it's that easily. Not, at least. It's just not how it works. Yeah. If I mean, if only, but yeah, it, it, but I don't know. It, it's, it seems quite yeah. grim to be honest. And it, it seems like the logical consequence of all of this, in addition to the seeming inevitability of the displacement, the displacement of the Palestinians is Biden loses, or I guess at least the DNC is irreparably tainted by this. Some people have said that voters will forget, but I genuinely, I don't think they will. There's too much. It keeps going on. Yeah. I mean, if like you could wave a magic wand and all of a sudden, you know, Gaza is back to how it was October 6th and people are back in their homes. 30,000 people have died. You know, the American people do have a extraordinary capacity to forget things like they probably could forget that. But that but you can't wave a magic wand. So you're going to you're going to have this this humanitarian crisis just spiraling for the next year. So people won't even have time to forget. Like, wh why is this going to be any better in October? of 2024 than it is right now. Like, I, I, don't, I don't see, you know, I will, I think, you know, you could be over, you could be at six figures worth of casualties at that point with God knows what else going on. So yeah, maybe they will forget what happened now, but they'll remember what happened in like September and October. Cause they, uh, unless, unless they get a full on ceasefire, um, Israel backs off the, the checkpoints and allows, just absolutely free humanitarian aid to flow in plus reconstruction equipment and evacuate and evacuates from from Gaza and allows a, a reconstruction like otherwise you you know the 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 crisis is just going to get worse and worse like 90% of Palestinians right now are telling the UN or whoever it was world I think world food program that they're that their days they don't eat anything uh dysentery like potential for cholera like nobody has access to you know barely anybody has access to like you know a sewage system there's no clean water like uh it, it's cold at night it's rain it, get, it rains on you and you're sleeping outdoors like you know we um we had a few we had a few hundred people suffer at fire festival for like two days and we made like 15 documentaries about it mm -hmm.